This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, Casey O'Callaghan is a, a philosopher at Rice University. He uh, came all the way to London just for this conference, so it's a great pleasure to have him. But also a great pleasure because Casey was one of the first philosophers to pay attention to multi-sensory perception and publish in this area. And he has kept publishing in this area since. So uh, today we'll be talking about two rates of uh, multi-sensory awareness. Uh, Um, thanks everybody for coming today, and uh, congratulations to those of you who are the recipients of the grant. I think if you're the sweet spot and you've got the, the value of the grant. So, congratulations. And, um, and thanks so much for the invitation to come. So, today what I want to do is distinguish six uh, differing varieties of multisensory awareness and just say a little bit about what it means to be multisensory. So let me start off with just a little bit of background before I begin. So most of my work in this area is guided by the idea that theorizing about perception, at least by philosophers, is driven predominantly by attention to vision and visual forms of awareness. More recently, researchers have been working to remedy this by paying attention to other sense modalities. So um, a number of individuals have worked on auditory awareness, others have worked on touch and bodily awareness, olfaction, taste, um, have all attracted attention. And so I think that this attention to the non-visual senses is a really promising new direction for philosophical inquiry, and I'm happy to see philosophers now contributing to a pretty thriving interdisciplinary research program in these areas. But I think that this doesn't go far enough. And that uh, there's still a tempting thought in the background, which is that perceptual awareness in particular amounts to or is exhausted by something like a collection, a co-conscious collection, of visual and auditory and tactual gustatory and olfactory episodes. Okay, so the idea there is that once we've told the story about each of the individual sense modalities, then we'll really have done everything there is to do in explaining perception or at least perceptual awareness. And I think in the background to this is a conception of, of the senses more generally. So this is Zen and Felician saying a while back that visual perception is best viewed as a separate process with its own principles and possibly its own internal memory, isolated from the rest of the mind except for certain well-defined and highly circumscribed modes of interaction. So this would be sort of stalking horse. Um, okay, so one of the reasons that we're here is that among the most fascinating discoveries in the recent psychophysics and neuroscience perception is that the senses involve extensive interaction and, um, and coordination, right? So the thought is that recognizing and exploring this has been among the most interesting developments in the cognitive science of perception in the last two decades. So we've learned that proceeding doesn't just involve visual, auditory, tactual, olfactory, olfactory and gustatory episodes uh, occurring in parallel and in isolation. It also involves extensive coordination and collaboration among sensory systems. So theorizing about individual modalities and treating them as explanatorily independent from each other fails to appreciate the ways in which perceiving one modality affects and also depends upon how we perceive with others. So what I want to do today, though, is step back a bit and think about the implications for perceptual awareness. And in particular, what I want to do is distinguish six differing ways in which conscious perceptual awareness may be multisensory. And each of these marks an increasingly rich grade of multisensory awareness. And each has correspondingly stronger consequences concerning how we understand and theorize about perception. Okay. So I think... Um, Together, these help us to see how the tempting thought that I mentioned earlier helps. So just to begin, um, people see and hear and touch and taste and smell. And they do so at the same time and co-consciously. So 
Perceptual awareness in this respect is at least minimally multi -centric. And by this I just mean, at a given time, it's possible for a subject to co-consciously undergo episodes of awareness associated with more than one sense modality. Now, this is the first grade of multi awareness, and I think it's relatively innocuous. Now, it's not entirely innocuous, as we know, um, so, Charles Spence and, and Tim Bain are skeptical whether perceptual experience is even in this minimal sense multi-sensory. So, they suggest that perceptual consciousness at any given moment is unisensory, that there's a quick switching back and forth um, between these different modes. Now, I want to resist this view for a couple of reasons that I'll just briefly mention. Uh, first of all, the view is most plausible if consciousness requires attention and if attention is restricted to just a single modality at a time. And I think there are good reasons to resist each of those. I won't um, get into those now. Uh, I'll just set them aside. Even granting that, the temporal grain of the experience present plausibly is coarser than these rapid switches between the modalities. And that, combined with the fact that there aren't any apparent temporal gaps between experiences associated with the different modalities, implies that there are moments during which, um, consciously present moments during which, um, perceptual experience is associated with different modalities at the same time. So I think there are times during which experience is at least minimally multi-sensory. Now, as it stands, I think this is a relatively weak claim, but we can turn it into a much stronger claim really quickly by just doing this. So the thesis of minimal multimodality is the claim that perceptual awareness at each moment is exhausted by that which is associated with each of the respective modalities, along with whatever accrues thanks to mere co-consciousness, or just simple co-consciousness. So the idea here is that perceptual awareness is just the co-conscious sum of its modality-specific parts, or components, or attributes. So, how do we start to challenge the thesis? Well, I think uh, the case of cross-modal perceptual illusions is a good place to look because these provide an important challenge <coughs> to claims about the explanatory independence of the different senses. So these are cases in which stimulation of one sensory system impacts and reshapes experience that's associated with another and in a way that leads to an illusion. So some examples of this, the ventriloquist effect, an auditory spatial illusion produced by the visible location of an apparent sound source. Uh, you've already heard about the McGurk effect involving speech where visual information impacts the phony that you seem to hear. And uh, one that I like quite a lot is the sound induced flash effect. So this is a case where hearing two blips impacts your visual experience in such a way as to make you think that you've seen two visible flashes. So just as visual illusions can teach us about perceptual processes and the organization of visual awareness, these cross-modal perceptual illusions can teach us something about multi-sensory processes and the organization of multi-sensory awareness. So, for instance, unlike other cross-sensory effects like synesthesia, these cross-modal um, perceptual illusions are pretty widespread. They happen across the population and even within a subject across a wide range of domains. And they result from principal perceptual organizing strategies that are at least intelligible as adaptive and advantageous. So the, the leading hypothesis about these things actually is that they enhance the overall reliability of perception and um, improve its accuracy. So this is uh, Shams and Kim saying that strategies are statistically optimal, even though under certain conditions they lead to perceptual illusions. So I've argued in, in some other work that these processes, stereotypically at least, involve reconciling conflicting or discrepant information from different sensory systems. But this notion of this idea of conflict, of course, requires that there's a common subject matter. You can't have a disagreement about something if you're not talking about the same thing. Otherwise, the disagreement is merely apparent. And so doing this conflict resolution across sensory systems demonstrates there's a kind of perceptual concern for the common sources of stimulation to multiple modalities. 
And this, in turn, suggests that there's a way of perceiving, grasping perceptually, or representing these common sources that can't be captured entirely in modality specific terms. So the idea is implementing these, these multisensory principles involves a way of being differentially sensitive to the common sources of stimulation. Um, so in this respect, then these, the cases in which cross-modal illusions are going on are evidence of a second grade of multisensory awareness, one that involves a kind of coordinated experiences across modalities. Now, there's a couple of limitations to this line of thought, and are important limitations. The first is that doing conflict resolution, first of all, doesn't require a way of perceiving or representing that's shared between the senses. And it also doesn't require representing or perceiving these common sources as such. And to see why, uh, here's just a simple example. Sorry, this slide is still a kind of mess, but I'll try to tell you what's going on with it. So this is a, um, just imagine a little, a simple system, right? What you do is you feed it pairs of Roman letter and a Braille character, okay? Uh, and so these, in, in parentheses, you don't feed it that. That's just an indicator to you to what Braille character that is. And what the system does is it always spits out a matching Roman character and Braille character. And uh, the algorithm that I used here is to average the alphabetical position and round up. But you can imagine it doing it in any number of ways. You could defer entirely to the Braille character, or you could defer entirely to the Roman character. Um, and importantly, the system could just use a sort of brute mechanism for doing this. It might just say, if you have one of those, then spit out one of those. Okay, so this is what you give it. <coughs> So this system is doing conflict resolution of a sort. In a sense, it's implementing a grasp on the common letters picked up by the Braille and the Roman characters. But the system doesn't have, involve any shared representations, at least the vehicles, between the two columns. And it doesn't need to involve um, representing that there's a common letter picked out by each of the symbols. So, just by analogy, in explaining the mechanisms of multisensory perception, we might only need to appeal to modality-specific ways of perceiving or representing things that, in fact, may be common. Right? So you can have totally modality-specific stuff, you just kind of coordinate it in this, this kind of way, and that suffices. That's the first limitation of the argument that I mentioned so far. The second limitation is quite a different one, which is that claims about perceptual processes and mechanisms just don't translate neatly and uncontroversially into claims about perceptual awareness. Um, so even if we've, after we've explained all of these processes, perceptual awareness itself might still be structured as a kind of co-conscious collection of coordinated, but nevertheless modality-specific episodes. Um, so that means all perceptual awareness might remain modality-specific. So then the question is, are there any core, irreducibly multisensory varieties of perceptual awareness? And I think the critical case is the case of intermodal, perceptually apparent intermodal feature lines. So I think this is the third grade of multisensory awareness. And it's critical because it marks the point at which you can no longer characterize perceptual awareness exclusively in modality-specific terms. So let me say a bit about what this is. Um, so you know, human beings perceive individual things, objects or events, as well as their features, either attributes, properties, qualities, or parts of those things. So when you perceive multiple features jointly to belong to the same individual, call that in the case of feature-binding awareness. Sorry, I should have a quote there. So now, paradigmatically, feature-binding awareness is in trouble. So you see the baseball to be white and spherical and to have laces on it. And uh, you might perceive the letter Q to have a visible part that the letter O lacks. And the case of vision is best understood. There's a rich empirical literature on 
visual feature binding and its relation to uh, visual awareness. But feature binding can occur in other modalities too. So you might hear the sound to be high pitched and loud. Or you might feel a surface to be smooth and cool to the touch. Or you might taste a cookie to be sweet and salty. Or you might smell an odor to be you know, intense and pungent or um, fragrant and light. These are, those cases are more controversial. I think there's um, discussion to be had, but this is the basic idea. So now, the question is whether there is intermodal feature binding. And a skeptical position has emerged, which is that there is intramodal but not intramodal feature binding awareness. So this is Matt Fulkerson saying that the predication or assignment of distinct features to perceptual objects is the distinguishing feature of unisensory perceptual experiences. Multisensory experiences don't involve the direct predication of features onto individual perceptual objects. Instead, it's an association between experiences. We experience a higher order association between sensory experiences. And here's Spence and Bain asking whether features belonging to different modalities are bound together in the form of multimodal perceptual objects, and they think it's debatable. Um, and perhaps it's a matter of inference or post perceptual processing. Um, so they say it's an open question whether one's experiences of a multimodal perceptual object or whether instead it's structured in terms of multiple instances of unimodal perceptual objects. <laughs> and finally, this is um, Mohan's uh, former student, Kevin Connolly, saying that multimodal episodes can be explained in terms of the conjunction of an audio content and a visual content but don't involve fused audio content. Now I think that there's a good case for a non-skeptical position, and it relies on a contrast between episodes of one and of two. One is that of perceiving things being F and things being G, and two is perceiving things being both F and G. The second requires that a single thing perceptibly has both features and the first doesn't. So here's just a within modality. I realized that I should have one and two reversed. Um, only uh, realized that in making this diagram. <laughs> so in two, a single thing uh, is both red and round. In one, something is red and something is round. Okay. So the second one requires that a single entity has those features. So in the intermodal case, then, my view is that it is perceptually apparent features perceived through different modalities are bound and that's belong to the same thing. So for example, you might audiovisually perceive an explosion to be both bright and loud, and that's kind of different from perceiving something to be bright and something to be um, something to be loud, as when you uh, see a camera flash while hearing a trumpet over and over. Okay, so what's the evidence then? First of all, the recent experimental research on multi-sensory perception reports that perceptual systems do bundle or bind information from different senses in order to yield unified perceptions of common, multimodally accessible objects uh, or happenings. So this is uh, Beatrice de Gelder and Courtois from 2000 saying it's reasonable to suppose that the organism should be able to bundle or bind information across sensory modalities, not just within them. So this is just a kind of representative sampling that I'm trying to show you now. Here's uh, the Tapis and Spence saying there appear to be specific mechanisms in the human perceptual system involved in the binding of spatially and temporarily aligned sensory stimuli. Here's Kubevi and Schutz talking about a particularly powerful form of binding that produces audiovisual objects. And here more recently is Navarra talking about the binding of audiovisual speech streams, which they say seems to be so strong that we're less sensitive to uh, audiovisual asynchrony in the case of speech than with other stimuli. So that's just an example, and there's, there's plenty of them to hunt down. One thing that I want to point out is that it's not enough to appeal to cross-modal uh, illusions and other interactions in order to establish that there's intermodal feature binding for sort of the reasons I mentioned before. So this is a, an old quote from Welsh and Warren in this classic paper. 
but they say the bias measured in these experimental situations in the intersensory discrepancy paradigm is a result of the tendency of the perceptual system to perceive in a way that's consonant with the existence of a single unitary physical event. Within certain limits, the resolution may be complete so that the observer perceives a single compromise event. The problem, as the discussion earlier was meant to, to draw out, is that there's a gap between perceiving in a manner that's consonant with the existence of a single unitary event and perceiving as of a single event. So further evidence is needed. Um, interestingly, the standard empirical measures for intramodal feature binding also provide evidence of intermodal feature binding. So things like the existence of illusory conjunctions outside of focal attention and object-specific preview effects, and, uh, benefits and penalties, as well as object and event files and temporary episodic representations of persisting real-world things and happenings. And um, superadditive effects have been studied and reported in a variety of intermodal contexts. So I think that you know, the important upshot of the experimental work is that perceptual processes do show signs of tracking or representing feature bearers as common across sense modalities and as bearing features perceptible through different senses. Now, the empirical evidence though also raises a problem for, for the project I'm talking about today. So in 2005, Mitroff and Scholl reported, this is for a visual case, that in this, you know, the streaming bouncing, I'd like to shoot my movie won't work, so I can't shot you to shoot the picture. Um, subjects reported consciously experiencing predominantly streaming percepts. However, the measures of object-specific preview benefits seem to favor the bouncing percept. So their claim is that in these kinds of conditions, the, the you know, results of the, whatever the object file system is are disagreeing with that of conscious awareness. And a similar thing was reported in the intermodal case by Zmigrad and Hummel. So the thought is the psychological explanations of these mechanisms just don't translate neatly and uncontroversially into claims about perceptual awareness because the implicit measures of when binding has taken place can disagree with conscious awareness. So, what about conscious awareness? Can we say anything about it? Well, I think that the contrast between one and two that I mentioned earlier marks a difference in how things may perceptually appear to be, whether or not you believe they're that way, and whether or not, in fact, they are that way. So, first of all, apparent binding can be illusory. <coughs> so, if you think about the case of ventriloquism, again, um, in a compelling example of it, you seem to hear that visible puppet speaking, even if you're not taken in by it in belief. And this will contrast with an unsuccessful case of ventriloquism in which it's evident to you perceptually that that visible puppet isn't the thing that you that you're hearing speak. At the movies, it's another example. Nothing in the theater utters the words that you hear and is also visible on the screen. So since there's no particular perceptible thing that bears both the visible and audible features, the appearance as of a common source is an illusion. And importantly, it doesn't need to be just a spatiotemporal illusion. You can place the speaker right behind the screen and you still might have the impression of a common source. And that would be illusion. Uh, or in the psych lab, um, same thing. So a mere case of one might seem like a case of two. And conversely, you can perceive features that in fact are coinstantiated, but um, which you fail to perceive as bound, or you perceive as um, unbound. So think about ventriloquism again. Even in the case where it works, you're seeing the individual who's generating the sounds. Right? So you're perceiving features which in fact are coinstantiated, visually and auditorily, but you're failing to perceive them to be coinstantiated in that case. 
Or the other example, I'm not sure this example entirely works, but I think, you know that thing where you go like this with your hands, that trick, and then you invert them, and uh, you try to raise the, the finger at somebody's point? So you're seeing all of your fingers, right? But the one that you end up raising, you fail to identify the visual information about that finger with the proprioceptive information about that same finger before you move. And then when you move, you get them collapsing onto the wall. So that's features. In fact, coincidentally, it just seems like a case of one. In addition to this, intermodal binding awareness can break down. So think about the case where you're watching a movie with a nice, uh, watching a movie with a nice, compelling, really immersive sound soundtrack. And then imagine that the soundtrack is a little bit off, right? so that you, um, in the case where it's just a little bit off, you might notice it, but it's not going to be disturbing to you. If it's a little more off and kind of jarring and really disruptive. And then in the case where it's really far off, the, the sights, the visible and audible information become wholly dissociated from, from each other. So what's going on in these cases is the auditory and the visual information independently are staying qualitatively the same, but the phenomenology is differing really unmistakably. So the alignment turns out to matter. So my claim in, in these cases is going to be that this dramatic phenomenological difference stems partly from perceiving uh, something jointly to have audible and visual features in the coincident cases, but not in the misaligned cases. I think the intermediate cases are kind of interesting examples where maybe you have evidence of binding, but um, they're still in the So the natural uh, objection at this point is going to be that these experiences differ in spatiotemporal respect. So once you control for the spatiotemporal differences, then any phenomenological difference is, gonna, is going to dissolve. And this is sort of, I guess it's worth noting that in this respect, for the philosophers, that the case parallels that of perceptually apparent causality. So that the spatiotemporal features are what's triggering the impression of causality. So it's difficult to control for awareness of those spatiotemporal features while varying the impression of causality. So I actually think that there's a there's a, a nice reply that can be given in the case of intermodal binding. Maybe it's even stronger than in the causal case. And that's that intermodal binding doesn't just depend on these low-level spatiotemporal cues. It also depends on things like whether and how the subject is attending, or on the plausibility of the combination or the compellingness of the match. So I'm sure those of you who here know this fact that the, the teapot will more easily than trilquise the, the sound of a teapot than the sound of a, a Mac truck, for example. So the thought then is that fixing the spatiotemporal features doesn't by itself suffice to fix whether or not awareness of intermodal binding occurs. Um, so let's see, in, in some context independent way. So here's um, Takis and Spence again saying, the perceptual system appears to exhibit a high degree of selectivity in terms of its ability to separate highly concordant events from events that meet the spatial and temporal coincidence criteria, but which don't necessarily belong, belong together. So the thought is, we can tease apart the appearance of intermodal binding from that of perceptually apparent spatiotemporal features. I think more evidence for this can be extracted from the fact that the capacity for intermodal binding can be selectively disrupted. And there are a few examples here. Um, Mike Beauchamp's lab has been doing some interesting fMRI guided uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation in order to disrupt visual tactual and audiovisual integration. Um, in the case of autism, individuals have difficulty integrating emotion cues from vision and audition. That may partly be a matter of attention, but notice that's fine with my with the kind of account that I'm giving. In the case of speech, Hamilton's reported a patient who is unable to find in information for vision and audition when it concerns speech, and proposes that multisensory binding of audiovisual language cues can be selectively disrupted while leaving intact binding for typical uh, environmental events. So controlling for the spatiotemporal differences, I think, need to dissolve the experiential difference there. So 
we can hold the spatial temporal feature steps while varying the appearance of binding, or whether intermodal binding awareness occurs. And this also, I think, it's worth mentioning, gives us a way to deal with that objection that I mentioned earlier about the empirical measures of binding and the connection with conscious awareness. So if you imagine that the object file system overall includes or incorporates mechanisms that are responsive just to those low-level features, uh, then the appearance binding might disagree with the verdicts of some of those low-level um, components of the overall system responsible for intermodal binding and, and awareness. That's the kind of overall system. So I conclude that intermodal binding awareness is a third grade of multisensory awareness. And the, the consequence of this is that it means that perceptual awareness isn't just minimally multimodal. Some ways to um, be perceptually aware of individual things requires identifying the cross modalities. And so can't be analyzed just in terms of ways that you could perceive with individual modalities all on their own. And so, for instance, visual tactually perceiving uh, things being <laughs> jointly uh, round and rough isn't just a matter of it's co-consciously seeming to be round while seeming to be, to be rough, um, where it just happens to be the same same item in play. Because being perceptually sensitive to or perceptually appreciating the identity of what's seen and felt isn't something that could occur unimodally. Right? Um, and it doesn't accrue just thanks to simple co-consciousness, because you could co-consciously have those things going on without making the identity. So this is an episode that's not factorable into co-conscious modality-specific components that could have occurred independently from each other. And one way, uh, I, I won't spend too much time on this, uh, uh, is that the issue partly is that it's not, perceptual awareness is it isn't closed under conjunction. I won't uh, go into that too much. For the philosophers, I'll leave that on the screen for a minute. So this means that overall perceptual awareness is more than minimally multisensory. It's not just a matter of co-consciously seeing and hearing and feeling and tasting and smelling. And so that thesis of minimal multimodality that I mentioned earlier fails. So that's kind of the first lesson. I think at this, at this point, um, a reasonable objection is to say that finding awareness, you know, which also occurs within a modality, is only an aspect of the structure of perceptual awareness. Uh, in other words, I characterize it in terms of the object of awareness, but somebody might say, look, it's just a structural characteristic of the experience itself. Jesse Prince has said this to me on a number of occasions. You know, maybe it's just due to synchronous processing or to mere uh, structural aspects of attention, but it doesn't involve awareness of some novel, perceptible feature of the world that's accessible only through multi-sensory awareness. So that brings me to the fourth, fourth grade. Suppose there were features, who, uh, some of whose instances were perceptible, but only by using more than one sense. Perceptual awareness of one of these novel feature instances couldn't just be a matter of co-consciously seeing and hearing and feeling and all of the rest occurring at the same time. So this fourth grade of multisensory awareness involves perceiving feature instances that are accessible only multimodally. So let me describe a couple of other examples I have in mind. Some relational features, feature instances, might be accessible only through multisensory experience. So start by considering simple spatial or temporal relations between things experienced with different senses. So, you can imagine, for instance, attending to the spatial offset of a sound that you hear to come just from the, you know, the left of a visible speaker that you see. Or you might imagine hearing 
uh, a sound to occur just a moment before a visible flashing of a light. And that's going to differ from if the interval is, is much larger. I think it, a nice example of this is you know, in baseball, again, um, umpires tell whether a base runner is safe or out by visually attending and looking for the moment that the foot strikes the base. Now, notice there's a problem, which is that they need to know whether the ball reaches the glove before or after that event. Um, so what they do is they, they're trained to listen for the moment that the ball strikes the glove. So they watch for the foot striking the bag and listen for the moment the ball strikes the glove. And I think one of the things that's going on there is they're multisensorily perceiving the relation and the interval between those two episodes. So a natural objection at this point is just going to be that these cases involve co-conscious but nevertheless modality-specific spatial and temporal location experiences rather than perceived intermodal relations. And the first part of my reply is that these kinds of relations are actually the subject of a rich and kind of expanding empirical literature. One example of this is intermodal synchrony perception. So here's Mueller talking about um, the fact that it, a lot of the research deals with the experience of perceiving the synchrony of events between different senses, even though the signals arrive at different times. Right. So the information about the visual information about event arrives quite a bit before the audio information. And here's um, Kujasaki's, you know, describing the fact that this is a significant cognitive achievement and says perceiving audio and visual aspects of physical event is occurring simultaneously, requires the brain to adjust for these timing differences and then also processing time differences. And talks about how brain attempts to adjust subjective simultaneity across different modalities. And here is Oh, so Stone talks about the point of subjective simultaneity requiring that the visual stimulus precedes the auditory stimulus by about 50 milliseconds on average. And Spence and Squire talk about a movable window for integration and a temporal ventriloquism effect, helping to explain perceptually apparent synchrony. So at this stage, the skeptic is just going to reply that this sub personal coordination just grounds synchronous experiences rather than experiences as of synchrony. So I think at this point you kind of end up in, just, I don't know, from my philosopher's mind, something of a stalemate. Um, so I think the best thing to do at this point is to, is to look for better evidence of the perception of novel feature instances that drive some distinctively multi-sensory experience. And at this point, to the best of my knowledge, the best way to reply is by appealing to intermodal meter perception. So Klein, in a study that came out in 2012, establishes that it's possible to perceive a novel audiovisual um, metrical pattern that's distinct from any audible or tactual meter. So they say, in the bimodal experiments, the auditory and tactual cues are integrated to produce coherent meter percepts. And they say that's the first demonstration of cross-modal sensory grouping between the two senses. I, that, that's, um, I wouldn't necessarily endorse that. But um, anyway, you'll see that they mean it of a specific sort, I think, um, here. So just I'm not going to try to explain meter perception here. So um, think about just a, a, a simple example involving some kind of rhythm, because I can demonstrate that really briefly. So imagine that I, I do this. So watch my hand and I make a certain rhythm pattern go. Okay, so there's a visible rhythm. And then, um, if you were to close your eyes, I can do an auditory rhythm, just a really simple one. Okay, very simple. Okay, so now, watch the hand and I'll combine the two, right? So I do this. So in that case, you know, you can attend to the visible rhythm, 
content of the optical rhythm, they differ. But it's also plausible to think that you can perceptually attend to the novel rhythm that comprises the visible and the audible events. And that differs from just simultaneously hearing a rhythm and seeing a rhythm. You could attend to those things as separate as well. Okay, so <coughs> perceiving the intermodal rhythm differs phenomenologically from perceiving either the unimodal rhythm in isolation and also from experiencing two simultaneous but distinct rhythms. That's the kind of thing that's going on in the meter. It's a bit different, but that's roughly the idea. Another example of this kind of thing uh, involves intermodal motion perception. So imagine hearing a you know fire truck coming towards you and then picking it up visually and continuing to watch it on a, a single motion trajectory. Now, uh, you know, a more compelling case than that is going to be that of a novel motion pattern that's only detectable intermodally. So maybe you could get a, a zigzag pattern that's uh, comprised of auditory and visual components, uh, or a circular pattern. Now, as evidence that there's a novel pattern in that, in that case, um, as evidence that there's a novel pattern in there, merely apparent or illusory motion would be good evidence. So, in fact, some researchers have reported that there is perceptually apparent, um, uh, sorry, merely apparent intermodal motion. So this is Harar saying, well, claiming to have confirmed it. But this turns out to be controversial. Okay, so, Huddleston reports not getting any apparent multimodal motion across visual and auditory cues. And I think there's kind of a lot to be said about what's going on in these studies. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is that, so this is, this is their display, and they've got LEDs and white noise. So one thing you might worry about is that the cues to its being the same object between the different positions are pretty weak in this case. You know, you not, might not be inclined so a stimulus that gave you better cues for object identity from position to position um, would um, plausibly generate different results. And the other thing to say is that performance was actually better on the multimodal condition than it was on the, on the audition alone condition in that plane, um, in contrast to the horizontal plane going around you. But still, in the multisensory condition, they got just about the same results as they did in the audition case using different sound cues. So that, I think, supports this idea that there's different, the cues to identification aren't present. Anyway, there's a lot more to be said about that. I'll just sort of leave that to the side. Now, at this stage, somebody might really insist that um, these psychophysical results only show that you detect these features rather than perceptually experiencing them. And I think in order to save some time, I'll just briefly describe this and, and move on. So one way to respond is by appealing to things like causal relations. <coughs> so plausibly, causal relations, uh, if you have a moderately liberal account of the kinds of things that can feature in perceptual experience, um, can be part of visual content, for example. And the intermodal cases provide some good examples. So, plausibly, as um, Matt Nutz has argued, you can experience a causal relation between a visible occurrence and a sound. So, there's much to be said there. I guess the thing that I want to, to really say is that, and um, you, know, you can go through these various kinds of contrast arguments and the like, but According to a moderately liberal account of perceptual awareness more generally, there's really no compelling reason that's special to the intermodal cases to not to deny that you could perceptually experience these relations. So, and, and that's, again, importantly, distinct. I'm saying that's distinct from the question of the empirical evidence supporting the detection of those features. I'm saying there's no special reason um, 
to think there's a problem with respect to them figuring in perceptual awareness or experience in contrast with the universal case. Okay, so, so these examples of novel, multi-sensorily perceptible feature instances is the, the fourth grade of multi-sensory awareness. Um, there's a limitation to these kind of examples, though, that's worth describing. So each of the features that I've just discussed belongs to a type that's perceptible just using a single modality. And so you can see spatial, temporal, or causal relations. And so, you know, correspondingly from the point of view of the perceptual system, someone might say the features or the feature representations aren't multi-sensory. Maybe they're amodal, but they're not in any deep sense multi-sensory. So, let me introduce the fifth grade of multi-sensory awareness. So suppose there were novel features of a type whose instances were only multimodally accessible. Features whose perception required awareness through multiple sense modalities, and that you couldn't be aware of through any sense working on its own, unlike spatial, temporal, or causal relations. And flavor sometimes gets mentioned as an example of such a feature. So flavor perception, philosophers are now beginning to uh, comprehend things in large part from the work of Barry Smith, involves taste and smell and somatic sensation. Um, and flavors aren't fully perceptible thanks to any of these senses we're working on it. Oh. So flavor experiences could have an, an entirely novel, multi-sensory phenomenal feature of a type that no unimodal experience could have and, and which don't accrue thanks to simple co-consciousness. So this is actually a, you know, it's a rich and uh, interesting case and there's a lot to say about it and I expect this to play out in the literature in, in years to come, but I want to mention what I think is the crux of the issue. Um, first of all, to put this out of the way, I think flavor perception doesn't involve a novel sense modality. There's no dedicated sense organ, flavors really do involve tastes and smells and um, you know, tingles. It's part of flavor experience that something tastes salty and, and also burns, for example. Secondly, and more importantly, if apparent flavor is just a kind of agglomeration, an undifferentiated mixture of gustatory, olfactory, and capsule qualities that are attributed to something in the mouth, then flavor experiences don't have any novel uh, wholly novel phenomenal features. But apparent flavor could involve either a structure, either structure of qualities or a temporal structure among these sense-specific components. Or it could involve something like an organic unity among those components. Or it might involve an additional qualitative component beyond any of those modality-specific features. In my view, we shouldn't rule out any of these at this point. And if so, then emergent features of a type that can't be perceived unimodally um, um, exist in the case of flavor. And experiencing them will be deeply multi-centered. So I think there's good evidence that one of these views is right. So those of you who are working, you know, who are looking for a good topic um, might think about how to how to extend that discussion. All right. So so that's the, the fifth grade. And let me so given the, the sort of forward-looking spirit of this of this workshop, I'm going to conclude and wrap up by speculating about a sixth and quite different grade of multisensory awareness. So I think the discussion so far establishes that perceptual awareness isn't exhausted by, um, on each occasion, what's associated with each of the respective modalities. But I think there might also be forms of perceptual awareness that are associated with a particular modality, but which couldn't have occurred if not for other um, sense modalities. Let me explain this a bit. So, say that a feature of perception is associated with a given modality on an occasion, just in case it couldn't be instantiated 
by an experience that's, uh, or sorry, just in case it could be instantiated by an experience that's wholly or entirely of that modality, but not of any other modality, under equivalent stimulation. So, for example, think about your multisensory experience right now. So the, the features of that experience that are associated with audition are those that a wholly auditory experience, an experience that's not visual or tactual or the rest, could have under equivalent uh, stimulation. So the, the arguments above are meant to show that the features of a given episode of multisensory awareness need to be exhausted by those that are associated in this sense with each of the, the respective modalities. But, and here's what's different about this kind of case. I think that there could be a difference in character between the auditory awareness of a creature who's uh, only ever had audition and the auditory awareness of a creature like you has a rich background of experiences with all of the other sense of modalities. So that would mean that there's a difference between a presently and historically purely auditory experience and an experience that's currently, at this time, merely or wholly or exclusively auditory, but where in the past it's occurred in the context of a rich background of multisensory perception. And this means that there must be auditory experiences that are cross modally dependent on other sense modalities. And I'll, I'll just, these are two potential examples, I'm not particularly wedded to either of these. There might be perceptual capacities that are parasitic on other modalities. So Strauss and Family famously said the purely auditory experience would be non spatial. He also less famously says that your auditory experience uh, can uh, involve awareness of locations, but that's thanks to the fact that you have inherently spatial, visual, and tactual experiences. And you can imagine a kind of Barclay in saying that visual awareness of spatial features requires tactual awareness of them. Maybe that might be an example. Another example might be a cross-modal variant of amodal completion. So you know, within a modality, there's this phenomenon where you can visually experience something to continue behind an occluder. So you do see that to continue behind the spoon as a single thing. And I think that that's a case where you perceive that thing to have parts which are not actually visible to you. And that impacts your how you perceive the, the parts that are visible. I think there could be a case where you auditorily experience something to have visible and yet unseen attributes, and that might affect your auditory experience of it. This is the kind of the other direction. So you, know, you might see that to be the sort of thing with audible parts, or audible aspects, even though you're not hearing those, or even though you're not hearing them. OK, so the idea is if there could be any such cross-modally dependent experience, then it would be a candidate for an experience of a single modality on an occasion, which in an important sense was multisensory. But it would be multisensory in a respect quite different from any of the above. It would be a novel variety of experience within a modality made possible only thanks to the other senses. It would be a sixth variety of multisensory awareness. So. That's the six varieties. Let me wrap up. Um, so I've discussed the six grades. Several of these are multisensory in more than just the minimal respect. And the important consequence is that not all perceptual awareness is modality specific. Some multimodal episodes require the kind of coordination that enables you to perceive novel features or feature instances or to identify individuals across modalities. And a related consequence is that not all phenomenal characters in the galaxies. Not even uh, the phenomenal character of um, these episodes is exhausted by that which is associated with each of the respective modalities, along with whatever occurs thanks to mere or simple co consciousness. And uh, the significant upshot of this is that the assumption of explanatory independence fails, even at the level of perceptual awareness. So we should abandon the sense-by-sense -sense approach, even for awareness. And that means no adequate account of perceptual awareness can be framed in exclusively <coughs> modality-specific terms, and the same holds even for phenomena.
character. And that's because perceiving involves much more than just seeing, hearing, feeling, and touching, smelling, tasting, and all of the rest at the same time. Thank you very much. So, sorry, uh, Casey, I'd like to um, offer you a way of upgrading some of your, uh, some of your examples. So, so take the, the, the example of uh, rhythm as a starting point. Uh, you said, uh, you know, you converted, a, a, you, you gave an audio-visual rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was pretty convincing to me because, you know, you could really see that, you, know, you could really feel that rhythm when you did it that way. Uh, now, you might say that what your demonstration showed was not merely that there was an audio-visual rhythm, but that the detection of rhythm, which you might have thought to be auditory, right, is only accidentally auditory. It can take, it can take uh, input from more than one modality, or it can take input from just one modality. And while we were inclined to think that it was unimodal, it's now demonstrated by your self to be essentially cross-modal, and it's just an accident when one modality uh, feeds into it. So um, extending that thought, you might think about things like agency uh, or causa causation, which again you put into your I believe the fourth grade of modality. Um, and it might be that when you, uh, when you sense um, agency, right? So for instance, suppose I um, touch, um, I, I, I slap a drum, and the drum emits a light. Mm. It's just, it just so, you know. So there I, uh, have a, 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 a sense of having caused both a sound and a light, um, or having brought about both a sound and a light. Now that's an essentially multimodal thing because, but it falls into your fourth grade, I believe, right now. But by my earlier argument, namely that what that shows is that it's just accidental that one, it's just one, when it's one modality. If you did that, then it would elevate it to the fifth grade of uh, multimodal awareness. Uh, the last step? I didn't get the last step. So, how so, so if you think that it's just accidental that it happens to be a sequence yeah. with input from more than one modality, but that the mechanism of, bind, oh, okay. of joining those things together could take uh, instances from more than one modality, then there's something systematic going on, and because there's something systematic going on, the uh, the feature that you, uh, the relation, I should say, uh, goes up to the fifth grade of multimodal involvement, which is uh, of a of a type. Yes. Okay. Um, I think three and maybe a half brief things to say. One is. Methodologically, I'm trying to give as much to the skeptic as possible in going through this. So I'm thinking, if I were skeptical that there is multi-sensory awareness, what would I be saying? And I'm sort of just trying to make the minimal move that's required in order to defeat various kinds of skeptical position. If I have my brothers, you know, or maybe the thing to do is just start off with a full-blown type and argue about all the consequences and then get in fights about particular cases later. Yeah, maybe that's a methodologically more sensible thing to do. Um, but I'll just mention my, that how I'm coming at this. So I, I sort of prefer that kind of view, but that's what's happening here. So I'm actually quite friendly to the kind of thing you're saying. Um, in the case of rhythm, then, the way I'm distinguishing the fourth and fifth grades is really just in terms of could you have perceptual access to that thing with a single sense modality? Does one suffice? 
So, right, the, the, rhythm the, is something... The idea is that you couldn't get rhythm without this essentially multimodal uh, uh, mechanism or process. Uh, then it would... Any I mean, yeah, so if you require some kind of multimodal context in order to possibly perceive that, then that's definitional of what is required of the fifth grade. Um, then there's this kind of interesting question about why is it, though, that you can perceive rhythm in the in unimodal contexts, though? Right. So maybe what maybe we have an instance of the sixth grade as well. We have a capacity in audition which is only possible or is parasitic upon multisensory awareness. So maybe that's the that's happening there. And, and oh, sorry. The last, the half thing is, um, I, I do not want you to think that I'm claiming these are um, exhaustive. But that there's not finer grained distinctions to make in some of these grades. So in particular, the sixth grade is really more like a variety. Patrick, was it a follow-up? No, it's not a follow-up. So um, I want to ask you about a skeptical position uh, that might be put forward by somebody who thought that there could be top-down influences on the phenomenology of experience. And this person would say, look, I grant you that there are the kind of phenomenological features that you described but they are merely the consequence of the result of those top-down influences on what are fundamentally five distinct sensory systems. <coughs> Seems to accommodate all the phenomenal features you talked about within that kind of picture. And then my question, I suppose, is to what extent, to my mind, and that's not really that sort of picture of the senses being thoroughly intermingled, because it's still a picture of the five distinct processes. Um, so, all right, to make sure I've understood, is the proposal that the phenomenology differs, but it's due to some extra perceptual aspect of phenomenology? Well, you might not view it as extra perceptual. I think the line between what counts as perceptual and cognitive is not a clear cut line. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out which question to answer. So should I be answering that question, no, or should no, I no, be answering the question about cognitive impacts, top-down impacts on lower level perceptual awareness. What do you think really the picture where there are not distinct senses, what that comes to? Because on the on the account you've given us, it could come to no more than there are senses, there are distinct senses, and then there are top-down influences on phenomenology. But really there's nothing that we would think of as undermining the whole that there's a visual system and there's an audio system and there's a tactile system and so on. Yeah, in a way I'm 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 trying to um, say things that are compatible with that relatively conservative picture. So I'm perfectly OK with there being an auditory system and a visual system. I'm saying perceptual awareness is not exhausted by what's associated with those systems uh, and what they could do on their own. So. I think we can classify experiences as visual or as auditory uh, or as tactual. What I think, what, what I, I think the mistake that's often been made is in saying that if something is visual, then it's not auditory. So I think that's what we have to abandon. So in my view, abandon the assumption that if an experience is visual, it can't. It's not auditory. So we can classify this very same thing as visual and auditory. It's that we, that, and then the claim is we can't get an exhaustive um, classification of experiences by modality if we take on board that exclusive. Half of what I'm getting at is um, encouraging you not to do is to separate the discussion of the mechanisms from the discussion of the phenomenology. Because you really just pull those apart and you're skeptical about the idea that the mechanisms are going to show us and think about awareness. And that leaves you with this picture, according to which, on, on my view, you don't really have um, intermodal or cross-modal perception because you have these things. It may be because empirical evidence of a kind of interaction which we couldn't accommodate within the picture of five distinct things and then top down the awareness. That's the thought. Several. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand 
you've got this conclusion about the sort of maximum of experience, that um, you've got um, that experience is not factorable into um, uh, independent DDR components, which could exist without that. Yeah. Right. I just want to try out a section of light on that. Good, because so you're inferring that from um, claims about how things see in experience, how the phenomenology and perception phenomenology is. So just thinking about um, the uh, what, what's grade three, the, um, the feature binding case. Um, so I guess let's grant that the phenomenology of the overall experience um, involves both vision and hearing, say, in some of those cases. But so here's like a sketchful model of what's happening, and we should like get a measure of conclusion. Um, so the, the two sentences, um, the block is red and it is square. Well, the overall meaning of that conjunction of sentences um, <coughs> requires that you have the first sentence of the second, and it refers back to the block. Yeah. Like that from. But you could have each of those sentences on its own. Yeah. Um, so that's just a sort of sketchful model that doesn't give the next physical of that experience. Yeah, the it and the it. Uh, I mean, there's there's two ways to interpret that. I mean, one way to interpret the sentence is that each gets its, you know, reference assigned separately. I mean, the natural way when you say it is blah and it is blah is that they're at work on the same thing. Uh, so that looks like a case where you, you there really is the assumption of a common thing. And I think there's the difference in the two kinds of pictures is that between a kind of singular content view where you have a singular term. Uh, that differs and in the case where it's the same the same term. And so one reason that I have for resisting that, you know, somebody so in I have a paper on binding awareness, and there's a section on responding to the singular content here, who says, well look, you know, just allow that there's singular content shared between the two, that captures the identity, and we're done. Um, but I think that's not right because for the singular content theorist, you take two visually indiscernible things, and you might not be able to tell whether you are seeing one or the other, right? From the you know first-person perspective. So that ducky, you know, one of them is is ducky O, and the other is ducky P. But that means that for a singular content theorist, you might not be able to tell from the first person in a way that would allow you to tell which is which. The situation where you're um, seeing O and hearing O from the situation where you're seeing P and uh, hearing O. So that means something additional is needed, right? So you need the content that O is F and G. And so what the, the contrast cases are meant to show is that you don't get that for free just by way of closure under conjunction, right? So you need something further. You need some further episode, especially across um, modality which look like, you know, if anything, they're different ways of entertaining context. And so that's this piece here. So I think the just saying, just talking about it is ambiguous between the two interpretations. On the, on the natural one, it supports my view. On the less natural one, it doesn't capture the various kinds of contrasts. Can I fit in two last questions? Two lines, very short. Okay, sure. So, um, I really liked all the um, considerations you brought in to make um, to try and um, show us that these things are perceptual as opposed to just having, say, in the intermodal binding case, just a belief that there is one thing. Um, and I, I think all the things you said, said for that case are relevant. And likewise, with the intermodal uh, meter perception, I think it's a useful, really super useful cases to think about. But I'm worried that the skeptic can really just dig their heels in and not cave in. Even though I agree with you that overall, you know, why should we not take these things into perception? So take the just I was gonna just let me in, illustrate with one case. So in the intermodal meter perception, and um, a skeptic might say, look, what's going on between you did your hand thing? What I did it internally was make an internal sound in my imagination, you know, like that. Da. And then uh, when you started to do the table one, well, I didn't need to do that. But when I then combined them, when you did the hand and the, and the tapping, I filled in in my auditory imagination the two sounds mm -hmm. corresponding to the hand and then, and then 
there's the sound that goes in. So I can do, I can agree that I can attend to the visible rhythm, attend to the auditory rhythm, and then attend to the visible auditory rhythm, but I don't need to invoke anything potentially multi or cross modal. Um, you know, it's going to depend on that being plausible across all the various cases. So, um, I think, you know, one of the good ones is uh, the audio tactual case or visual tactual. So, you know, visual tactual motion cases on the arm that you see and you feel things going on your arm. So, yes. I think there are things the skeptic can say, and ultimately, my concern is not to refute the skeptic. Uh, it's really to push the evidence in favor of a non-skeptical position. And so I think the imaginative explanatory strategy is less plausible across the full range of cases. I think you could um, directly distinguish cases where you see, um, you could take a, a baseline of how you detect <coughs> each other in one modality and when, when you need to record that auditory and then use it. And it's joining like another direct recording of the two. Different uh, reaction time. Right. An intentionally demanding task, and you know, that would be interesting. So there, there would be a way of saying that I'm working on that. That's oh. well, so where we're really running It's just one statement. I think the music perception people sometimes distinguish between meter and pulse because meter is a highly internalized thing. So I think there could just be some issues. With neither as an example. Patrick was a very nice question. Oh, well, uh, thank you for your talk. So, uh, a question which comes up a lot here is what is a modality? And I think we don't really know. And as I remember from your last slide, um, modality was a, was a key word, which which came back in. Perhaps we can just see the last slide. Yes. want to avoid formulating perceptual awareness in modality specific terms. So at least I think it's interesting to discuss what a modality might be. How would you know one if you found one? And in, in sensory neuroprosthetics, the increased possibility to interface directly with, with the brain, um, I think is going to quite possibly generate some very interesting data in the next 10 or 15 years. So we might well be able to generate completely novel forms of sensory experience. What on earth are we going to do with them? Are we going to say, oh, it's not a modality? Are we going to multiply them? I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, a couple of things to say. I mean, I think there are lots of modalities. The sensory modalities are some of the modalities of perception. The exteroceptive ones are some of those, and the interoceptive ones are some of those. Uh, and I think the right answer to this question is to be pluralistic. Um, there are episodes, there are events that happen, and we can classify them in different ways. So I think um, Fiona has done a lot to motivate this kind of picture and has done a really nice job saying we can talk about the kinds of things that bring them about, we can talk about the sense of organs that are involved, we can talk about the you know kinds of pathways. We can also talk about the varieties of experience that occur. Um, in the case where it's totally novel, you know, where there's some new entity, I, I mean, I'm less inclined to think about it in terms of a perceptual modality in that case. Um, part of the reason is, is, actually this is connected with some things that Mohan uh, has discussed uh, concerning kind of information gathering techniques, um, ways of gathering information about the world, which I think is you know, central to our understanding of perceptual modality. If it's just some kind of novel new feature present in your experience, I think we should just characterize it as that. Um, but if it's systematically related to items in the world, you know, and there's a kind of robustness to it and certain patterns that we're after, I think um, there's certainly no harm in calling it a modality. Um, it may not be a, an exteroceptive sensory modality, 
because we think of having a dedicated sense or evolutionarily dedicated sense organ as being so central to that. So I think the best thing to think about these cases is that these are like more like homeostatic property cluster kinds than they are like um, you know essentialist natural kinds. Uh, and once we think of them in those terms, then the explanatory possibilities um, you know, become more flexible. Mm -hmm. This, no. uh, you can say it easy, but it's very simple.